Said, Good morning. <laughs> now y'all wait. We're going to sing glory to his name. Y'all stand up and sing it with us. Should be up here on the screen. <laughs> Lord, please. 
Before we get into today's message, Thursday is Veterans Day, and what we'd like to do is just recognize our veterans. And so if you have served and uh, you are a veteran in any of our armed surf, uh, services, we would like for you to stand, and we would just like to acknowledge you by a round of applause. Would you please stand if you served in any of our armed services? Thank you so much for your service and for your dedication. We want to just bow and pray for also for those um, who have served and also for those who have lost loved ones throughout this time. Father, we love you today and we thank you for this time together. We thank you for the service of good soldiers that you have provided through many, many years that have given that ultimate sacrifice. Lord, it's just a representation of your sacrifice that you have given for all of mankind. And Lord, not one sacrifice that we could give would suffice for all of the world, but only your, your, your sacrifice. Lord, we thank you for what you have done. We thank you for these men and women who have served here in our, in our, in our country. And I pray that they can continue to um, uphold the values and pledges that they have made, first of all, to you and then as our country upholds the values and pledges that your word teaches, we will uh, honor those things. Lord, we pray for this time together. We ask that you would open our hearts and our minds. In Jesus' name, amen. The last two Sundays, well, three Sundays ago, we talked about the adoption and being born again and the difference between, I mean, the, how these things are the same, and even though they sound like different terminology. And then I got into this. I said, if I had you write down on a three-by-five card what determines if you are a true believer, what would that look like? What makes you saved, all right? And so we went through the things that didn't necessarily make you saved, and people would talk about their morality. People would talk about their giving or their going to church or because they serve God, and they would look at it that way. And I said, these things do not testify of that. But then we also, last week, we looked at the, the things that do this is what is a representation of a Christian. So we talked about the sin aspect, and we talked about that. But today I want to go a different direction, and this is a two-part thing. I love the book of Romans. If you've never sat down and read and studied the book of Romans, you are missing out. Chapter 6, 7, and 8, if you're wondering how is it that we're saved and we're kept, I mean, Romans 6, 7, and 8 is a is beautiful chapters about your salvation. And I'm going to challenge you to read this book, take it step by step. Um, one day I will teach through that. It will only take probably 200 Sundays, but I'll go through it, you know. And so, but today I only want to do all of chapter 14, and it's just going to take two weeks. And in Romans chapter 14, it's actually, it actually starts in verses 13, uh, chapter 13, and it goes to 14 and goes to 15. So you kind of have to understand the whole premise behind it. The premise behind this is... He is talking to Christians. I'm not talking to unbelievers at this point. That was last week. This is to Christians. When he says us, when he says we, he's talking to the church that was in Rome. And when he's talking to this church, he says there's an issue going on. And I would say we have the same issue in our churches today that was going on at Rome. The issue was this, that there was a great diversity of people. They had, they had Gentiles, they had Jews. They had all different cultures and nationalities and, and backgrounds and, and races and genders. And he says, this is affecting how you respond to other people. When I was in college, we, I took 
summer classes, um, so or, or Christmas classes, or whatever it would be. So basically, uh, you would stay after your semester is over, which was very disheartening to watch all these people leave campus, and you know you're sitting there. In the end, it was worth it. But you you stayed for a two week seminar, and they basically took a whole course and they condensed it to two weeks when well, I really didn't condense it because you're doing eight hours a day for two straight weeks so you walked in for two days and then you had a test and then you walked in for you know another day then you had a midterm I mean the information that was coming to you was incredible and I remember taking three credit classes because it was good to get rid of your three credit classes during those two weeks right But I'll never forget that we were getting ready. The next day would start our classes. And so the rooms that we were in were kind of bare. I mean, you just, you basically had your one book, your book bag, some pens, some papers, notebooks, whatever, computers, were there still the big ones that were sitting on the desk at that point, right? And so the the room was pretty empty, but, you know, you were just kind of waiting to go to the next meal, and, you know, because you weren't in class. I mean, everybody was gone. And so they kind of put you in a room where guys you may know or you didn't know. I mean, they didn't care. They were just consolidating it to a floor. There was very few of us that stayed. And there was a particular young man there that I had just met maybe a week or two before, which I thought it was funny that he was in my room. Well, I had just set up my computer, and I remember I was like, there is nothing to do. This this place is dead. So I pulled up the game solitaire because basically that's pretty much what you had on those you know first computers I pulled up solitaire and I remember I mean the screen was facing the door so you know when you walked in you could see what was on the desk and I was sitting there and I was just clicking bored out of my mind just waiting to get going so we can get home and I was playing solitaire and that door opened and this guy that was standing with me walked in and he went <gasps> And he ran. He sprinted. And I have never seen fear on somebody's face. And he said, what are you doing? And I said, nothing. He said, you're playing cards. And I said, no, I'm playing solitaire on the computer. I mean, I don't understand what you're talking about. He said, you shouldn't be playing cards. This is awful. He said, this is sinful. I said, nobody's ever told me this. He said, I was raised by my grandmother that it was sinful that if you ever played cards, you need to repent. And I can look at his face right now, and it was scrunched up, and he was so concerned. I think for my soul, how can you be a Christian and play solitaire on the computer? And as I was getting ready for this, I thought about this young man. And Romans 14 is talking about this very thing. You know, with the diverse groups of people that will be on this campus and backgrounds, and because some of you, if you were to be honest, some of you in your generation was raised that if you played cards, it was sinful. And you better not ever touch a hand, a deck of cards because it was associating with gambling and gambling and all the things that went along with that. There are churches that refuse to have cakewalks. Just won't do it. It's gambling. People ask me what I think about gambling, and I says, well, I'll tell you this, our church does it every year. Every time we have a putting contest sitting on the green, right? Pay $5, get a chance to win. It's a gamble. There were churches who would stay so far. We would be, oh, that was terrible. I can't believe you would have a putting contest. You know what the church is thinking? How can we raise more money? There's people that would not eat certain foods because of this. They They would say it would be wicked if you ate pork or you ate red meat. If you ate chicken, so therefore I'm only going to eat vegetables. There are people who would say, if you're a Christian and you have a TV in your house, it's wicked. There are people that say, if you go into a restaurant, I was, I ran a mission trip one time, and I had 28. I think some of you may have been in that on that mission trip. 
If you've ever been in Miami Airport with 28 people, you're just glad to get all 28 through the airport. But not only that, we were seven hours, I think, and nobody had anything to eat. If you're with 28 people that haven't eaten, you're in trouble. So as a leader, I was trying to get closest to my gate because I was like, I don't want to take a chance of missing the call and all those things. And I'm, I'm moving and maneuvering 28 people to the right area. Now, if you've ever been in Miami Airport, you know that you have a very, very small window of restaurants that will even serve 20 be able to hold 28 people so i'm trying to get everybody and i had like 40 minutes to do all this and our plane took off and i had a meeting and i said okay here we go if you're wanting to eat this is what we're going to do right here if you don't want to eat it's okay but you're going to sit with us i want to know where everybody's at we walked in this little hamburger joint and it had uh some some fish and different things i'll never forget there's like a blue marlin above the above the sign and so I walked up to the manager, and I said, this is what we're going to do. You know, they're used to rolling people through there. That's what they do. And I said, I got 28 people. And I said, I need you to sit us wherever you can sit us. And she's like, I'm there. I'm, I've got you. And we sat down. She pulled out the card, and she showed me this is where everybody's going to go. And I said, okay, I want you five here. I want you four here. I want you three here. I want seven right here. And I was like, sweet. We got everybody. I mean, we had just enough seats. And I had a particular person standing over here just like this. And I said, my patience becomes, God's working with me, I promise, but what are you doing? Motion me, and I came over, and I was like, I don't have time to talk to you. We got to get this done. He said, I don't think I'm going to eat. I said, okay, that's fine. He's like, don't you want to know why? And I said, no, not really. <laughs> he said, you sat teenagers and me at the bar I can't believe it I said do you, are you going to you going to have a mixed drink or a beer Absolutely not I said what are you going to do you going to eat dinner Yes I said well then eat dinner I said we didn't put them at the bar to drink we put them there because that's where they could serve them dinner And by the way we filled up the entire bar it was just the way, eat dinner and let's go. And I said, so you need to choose. If you want to sit here, sit here. If you don't, then don't. It's okay. I didn't do this to offend you. I did it so we could eat dinner. And I walked away. And honestly, at that point, I was like, whatever you need to do, that's what you'll do. You know what he did? He got up there, he ate dinner. And we left. And he was okay. A couple days later, he was fine. But there are people, and that's what this is a talk, talking about, is that I'm going to bring my past traditions and what I think is right. And here in Romans 14, he says, as Christians, we do have liberties. And how do we handle our liberties? There's people who would say that I'll never step in a movie theater because of what is playing or what people may think that I'm watching or whatever, so you know what? They choose not to go into a movie theater. There's people that say if you take a little bit of leaf and you wrap it up in paper and you smoke it and, 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 and as a cigarette, that that is wicked and that's evil. You should never, ever do that. There are people who would say that if you wear a beard, that is unscriptural, and there's people that would say if you don't wear a beard, that is unscriptural, and who is right? Let me go ahead and tell you what this passage is talking about. It is talking about preferences, opinions. What do you think we have more problem with in the local churches? People dealing with sin or people fighting over their opinions and preferences? See, this is what's going on then. People have their preferences and their opinions. And honestly, I've seen it where I think people would stand for tradition and opinions and preferences stronger than they would for actually thou shalt not and thou shalt. And so Paul is handling this in, in this church because they have the same problems that we battle with. Now, if you have sermon notes and you want to look, it's just going to be a, a couple minutes before I can get to those. I want to go through some things. 
I want to, this is kind of the background of Romans chapter 14, verse 2. It says, one person has faith that he may eat all these things, but the one who is weak eats only in vegetables. Now you think, okay, is this just a food matter? And the answer is absolutely not. In verses 21, you're going to see later on um, next week and a little bit this week, he's going to deal with drinking wine. He's going to be eating meat, eating vegetables, and celebrating certain festivals. So there are four things that he's going to bring up of what was going on in this place. We could add a lot to that, as I already have. And so, this is the background. Let me tell you what the Jews were doing. See, the Jews had come from a very strict background that, that the laws had touched every area of their lives. What is the purpose of the law, the Old Testament law? The Old Testament law was to show you that you cannot keep the law. Therefore, this is when Jesus Christ comes onto the scene and he says he is perfect. The law reveals that we're not perfect. You cannot keep every law. And he says you were never designed to keep every law. So if you still go back to the Old Testament and you says, well, this ceremonial law says this, this ceremonial law says this, this ceremonial law says this, and you still try to live by ceremonial law, Jesus said, mm -mm, that is dead to you. Let me tell you what's alive to you. The moral law of God from the Old Testament. There's a difference. That thou shalt, thou shalt not. We are not talking about sin. We are talking about preferences and opinion. And see, the Jews say, I have to be careful what I can and cannot eat because that's the way I was raised. That's the way my parents and my grandparents taught me. I need to be careful how I even cook it. I can't cook it in this manner. I have to be careful what I wear. I have to wear this type of clothing. By the way, if you go to Leviticus, a lot of people talk about inking your skin and how Leviticus goes back and says you shouldn't ink your skin because Leviticus chapter 19, but read two verses down. It says you shouldn't wear polyester and cotton and cotton and silk. Don't mix two threads. And they're like, well, wait, wait, wait. that don't apply. I mean, that don't apply. Let's not talk about the thread. Let's just go back up to inking yourself. Let's just pull, pick and choose what we're going to talk about. It don't work that way. And see, this is what he's saying. He's saying, look, he says, the type of clothing, the days you celebrated certain festivals and feasts, they were still hung up. And there were Christians, they were really Christians, but they're like bringing back their culture and their traditions. And they're trying to be a Christian and celebrate and keep these things. But then you had the Jews. The Gentiles, I mean, I'm sorry, the Jews and then the Gentiles, you had a whole other culture. These people came out of wild, pagan, uh, religious backgrounds. They had huge orgies. They had their own temples. And now they are believers in Jesus Christ. And let me tell you what would happen here. They would have meat. I'm going to give you the real short version of this. They would have meat, and they would bring it to their festivals. And they would lay it on the altar. And they would sacrifice this meat to their gods. And so they would worship and they would have this time. They would pick up the meat and they would lay it out at the table and they would only eat a portion of this meat. The very next day, this unused food would be taken to the marketplace and laid out on the tables and it would be sold to everybody in the community and those proceeds would go back to the temple so that they can continue buying food, worshiping, having these orgies, buying their alcohol, all this stuff. So essentially, now what was happening was the Gentile Christians, they became Christians and they came out of this background and now they're being offered this meat. And you know what comes up in their mind? I remember the orgies. I remember their drunkenness. I remember laying that meat on the altar. And now all of a sudden, these Gentile Christians, they're offended. They're stumbling. They're stumbling over the fact is how is it in the world that you can offer me this meat that was last night offered to idols and I'm supposed to take it and I'm supposed to eat it and I'm supposed to be okay with it? And these Jews are saying, wait a minute, you're okay with not keeping the festivals and, and, the, and, the, and the Passover and all these activities that the ceremonial law says? You're not, you're not okay with that? I have a problem with you. And now we have diversity. We have a lack of unity, and nothing has to deal with Scripture. It all has to do with what? My opinion and my preferences. So the Gentiles became very narrow-minded in Christian liberty. Some of the Jews were very narrow-minded in their Christian liberty. So this is where our notes kind of start. In our introduction, 
these passages are not talking about this. That it's okay to live like you want to live, to do what you want to do, because you have the liberty to do so. Let me tell you this. Some of you have already begun and understand that you have liberties and freedoms in Christ. And you're like, man, this is so nice. I understand my freedoms. I understand what I can and cannot do. I understand that. I have the freedom to do this and to do this and to do this. But this passage is not about because you have the freedom you can, or liberty, you can do it. But not only this is weaker Christians need to be reprimanded for being weak. You see, he's going to talk about the weaker Christians are weak in their faith, and I'm going to explain what that is. So in this room right now, I'm going to go ahead and tell you, we have weak faith Christians and we have strong faith Christians. Every local church you go into, this is what we have. Some of you are weak and some of you are strong, and it's based upon this, upon Romans chapter 14. Some of you understand the liberties and the freedoms you have in Christ, and some of you have brought your traditions and your background and your past, and you're still lo- living under this type of ceremonial law that the Bible and Jesus Christ does not hold you to. And what he's doing is, is he's saying, okay, for you that are stronger in your faith, I am going to help you work with the weaker in their faith. And those who are weak in their faith, I'm going to tell you how to respond to the stronger in their faith because there is a division. What these passages are saying is unity is more important than you saying, I believe this, or my opinion is this. Or if I had my preference, it would be this. Strong Christians, you are not to look down on those who are weaker in faith. And not only this, weaker Christians, you're not to look down on the strong believers. Why would a weaker Christian look down on the strong believers? Because here's the truth. There are weaker Christians that says, I am don't feel the liberty or freedom to do this. And this person's over here. And they're eating this meat. They're eating this. They're doing this. They're going to the movies. You know what you're doing. You're just taking advantages of your freedoms and liberties. In fact, you're a carnal Christian. And so the weak in faith says, you know what? I am righteous because I didn't go to the movies this week. But that person over there that walked in that movie theater... They are carnal. In fact, it's kind of like a it's kind of like a feather in your cap, isn't it? I don't do that. That's why I'm spiritual. And some people are bragging on themselves because of what they do and don't do, rather than saying, you know what? Do I have the freedom to do this in Christ? The stronger Christians are going. Do I have the freedom to do this in Christ? And he's trying to bring unity together within the church. Verse 1. He says, Now accept the one who is weak in faith, but not to have quarrels over your what? Your opinions. Accept them. Don't exclude people because their preferences or opinions are different than yours. Don't look down upon them for this. What makes them weak? I have several things. Number one. Because I think they get hung up on their past traditions. The weak person, they get hung up on their past uh, uh, um, traditions. Some, sometimes people that are weak, even if you've been a Christian for 40 years, that doesn't make you a strong Christian. That doesn't make you a mature believer, by the way. Isn't that what Paul says? Those should be teaching are still being taught. Some people that have been saved for a very long time, they're still babes in Christ. They still don't understand the principles and oracles of God of some of the basic understandings of the Scriptures. Some of them have a a, a lack of knowledge, understanding. They can't comprehend it. But some people, they don't get into their own Bible and study it. Some of you believe what you believe only because that's what's been taught here. Not because you have opened up the Bible and studied it for yourself. Not only this... A weak Christian doesn't understand the freedoms they have in Christ. They think Christ is smothering them. If you believe Christianity is about do's and don'ts, you have missed it. Christianity is not about do's and don'ts. Christ has come to set us free. Do not ever misinterpret what I'm saying. I'm not talking about sin. I'm talking about opinions and preferences. The truth is, there's a lot of gray areas in the Scriptures. If you don't believe that, I did a whole series with my youth one time. I talked about the gray areas of our lives. Things that they're trying to get exact answers to. And I bring it down to the basic understanding of when we come down to the bottom line, Scripture is just not clear. 
So what are you going to have to do? You're going to have to come before your God, and you're going to have to say, God, do I have the freedom to do this, or do I not? And that's what it's going to come down to. But not only this, weaker Christians, they put restrictions on themselves that Christ does not, and because they put restrictions on themselves, they also put restrictions on other people. Some of you grew up in a day and age where after Sunday church, you went and stayed in your clothing. If you were a little kid, you were not allowed to run outside and play. You were not allowed to go and ride your bike. You had to sit still and do nothing. Some of you grew up in that era. Some people are, have grown up by the fact that they don't feel the freedom to go out to eat on the Sabbath day. They believe Sabbath day is Sunday. Sabbath day is Saturday. Some people say this is God's house. Some people believe, you know what, this is not really worship because we're in a family life center that we need to be in a chapel. I want to tell you this, we could sit outside in the playground and worship because God does not reside in a building made with man's hands. He decided that in 70 AD when he destroyed the temple. God resides inside of us. And so when you come down to the bottom line, some people are weak because they are stricken by legalism. And if you walked in here with long hair and you're a man or you had short hair and you're a woman, people would struggle with that. Or you don't wear this certain type of clothes or you wear that clothes or whatever, you would struggle. They would struggle. And I'm not talking about anything sinful or provocative. But they look at you differently. Some people just have lacked proper teaching. So we have a difference of opinions. I said, here's one of the first opinions. A person has faith, he may eat all things, but the one who is weak, he only eats vegetables. And so there are people who refuse to go out to eat right after church today. And by the way, this is not me talking about your belief, your preferences, your opinions. By the time we get to the end of this, you're going to understand I am not condemning anything like this. If you believe that you're not allowed to go out to eat after church today, because you're making somebody else work, then you better not violate your preferences and your opinions. But if you look at somebody else and say, I can't believe you're making that person work on Sunday, don't judge them. Because you know what? They have a clear conscience about this. We're not talking about sin here. You know what I enjoy doing sometimes on Sunday in between church service? I enjoy mowing my yard. Some people go, Lord, Chris, you mowed your yard. You know why I enjoy mowing my yard? Because I can put some earphones in. I can turn on a particular pastor that I like to listen to. And I can mow for an hour. And nobody calls me. Nobody's talking to me. It is serenity. Now, if it's work to you and you feel like you violated your conscience, guess what? Every time I mow, I don't violate my conscience. But if I did then I would be wrong. You see, in this particular thing, he says there are some who believe they may eat all things. One person, whoever that is, understands that they, all things were made by God and they're free to eat whatever he's given us. And this is what God had to reveal to Peter. I could go back to Peter and Paul's conversation where Peter was acting one way towards the Gentiles. He sat down with a ham sandwich and all of a sudden he saw the Jews walked in and he ran over and he was like, I'm not eating no ham sandwich. And, and when he's going back and forth, all of a sudden there's Paul and he says, and I withstood him to his face because he was being two-faced. He said, you need to choose. If you're free to eat ham, then great. But if you're not, then don't, don't pretend. But don't judge the one who is. And by the way, remember when Peter had the, had the vision and he saw all the animals and Jesus says, all these are clean to you. And Peter, Peter then, I had the freedom to eat these things. And he says, there's going to be some who have these freedoms. We're not talking about, we're not talking about moral law. We're talking about ceremonial law. He says the weak is only going to eat vegetables. He regards to them as weak in their faith, meaning this. Jesus has not put the, vegetation, the vegetarian uh, um, uh, hindrance on you. You did that to yourself by your traditions and your backgrounds. He says Jesus didn't do that. You've done that. So therefore, it makes you weaker in your faith. 
versus those who are strong in their faith. Verse 3, the one who eats is not regarded with contempt. The one who does not eat and the one who does not eat is not to judge the one who eats. God has accepted him. What is he saying? Don't look down on the weak one. If the person says, you know what, I'm not free to do this. He says, don't look down upon them. Don't put them down. If you don't believe that, it's, do you believe it's okay to wear pants? And some people, somebody says, I don't ever think a woman should wear pants. Don't look down on each other. Jesus has not put that restriction. Man has. And then he says, don't judge the one who does eat meat. You see, the weaker Christian was looking at the one who's over there eating meat and going, I can't believe they're eating meat. God has restricted that or whatever. Or my opinion is, my traditions have taught. And they believe it. He says, don't judge them for sitting there eating meat. Because God has accepted them both. Sitting there, we had a youth house over at Vandalia, and I'll never forget that there was a bunch of teens before service started. We were all sitting there talking, and there was one particular girl. She was about uh, 14 or 15 years old, and I remember she had really long hair. It was beautiful hair. And the, and the, and the ladies were commenting, the girls were commenting about how beautiful her hair was, and, and they said, do you ever plan on cutting it? She said, no, that's something that me and God have decided. So she had my attention. I said, can you, can you elaborate? She said, I have, not, I have decided that I'm not going to cut my hair. And she said, before the Lord, I told him, I said, this is a sacrifice that I'm doing for you. If you died on the cross for me, then I can also not cut my hair. This is the decision between her and the Lord. You know what I said? That's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. No, absolutely not. You know why? Because that was her preference, her opinion. That was her stance before the Lord. You know what she didn't do? She didn't look at somebody else, another lady who had shorter hair, and says, I cannot believe that you're not really sold out for God. She had a proper understanding. And she says, look, if you have short hair, if you have long hair, guess what? You're both accepted by God. You're accepted by God, not by what you do and don't you do. If we remember that from last week, you're accepted by God because his son, Jesus Christ, and his righteousness. That's why you're accepted by God. And then verse 4, he says, who are you to judge one another? To his own master, he stands or falls, and he will stand for the Lord. He is able to make him stand. He says, who are you to judge? And by the way, if you're talking about sinful things, Matthew chapter 18, as a person has sinned against you, you go to him alone. We're not talking about sinful things. We're not talking about moral things. We're talking about preferences and opinions. He says, who are you to judge them? He says, because why? They have a judge. Me and my cousin were talking about something one day. And he said, you know what? I have enough stuff in my own life and enough stuff that I'm dealing with that I can't look around and point fingers to nobody else in this area. He said, that is between them and the Lord. And that's what Paul is saying here. He says, they already have a master. The Lord is their judge. The Lord is, the, uh, is taking care of them. Don't pass this judgment on fellow Christians. Why? Because all you're doing is causing division within the local church. Over stuff that doesn't even matter. And then verse 5, he says, One person values a day over another, and another values every day the same. Each person must fully be convinced in his own mind. Here's where he brings in the days. So now here's another argument. The other, the other argument is that we're talking about preferences and discussion. He sends certain holidays and festivals. Man, I'll tell you what, some people would be... I remember when, when churches started having church on Saturday night. Or they had church or service on Friday night and they moved it different times of the week. I remember hearing people saying, I cannot believe they are having church on Friday night. Whatever it was, it worked in their schedule and, and it just worked. You know what he's saying here? Stop getting caught up on days. Stop getting caught up on festivals and activities and Passover Jews. He says, but not only this. Christmases and Easter, do you understand how pagan Easter and Christmas holidays, how they started? The bowing down and worshiping of the Christmas tree, laying down the present, study it sometime. If you ever study about Easter, it is the picking up of Easter eggs. It's one of the most pagan holidays that we could celebrate. 
And there's people that are going, I'm not picking up no Easter egg. I'm not doing it. I, I know that represented the moon god and all, I mean, all that stuff. I can explain all that. I think I have in Sunday school one time. I'm not doing it. I'm not celebrating this pagan holiday. And you know what I would tell them? Okay, if that violates your conscience. And I don't think you should either. <laughs> if that violates your conscience, then don't celebrate it. Don't, don't do an Easter egg hunt. But there's people that refuse to put a Christmas tree in their house because of the originality of this, of bowing down and playing this, and it was a type of idol worship. Study it. And there's people who says, I refuse. And they walk in their house, and they go, you shouldn't have that tree, and let me tell you why. Chapter and verse. Why shouldn't they? You know why? Because it's your opinion, it's your preference. Do not put your opinions and preferences on somebody else and ask them to live by that. So Paul is saying here, I think I've been able to stop moving this, uh, Tyler, if you can help me. Paul is saying this, that the Jewish festivals and feast and the Sabbath were now dead. That's what he's saying. He's saying, look, if you have church on Saturday, if you have it on Friday, if you have it on Thursday or Wednesday or Tuesday, he said, I don't care. Just don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together. We have to have this for building up one another. And by the way, he doesn't say this is the proper amount of days that you should meet a week. Because if you really want to get technical, the New Testament church met every day of the week. So if you feel really spiritual because you come three days a week, they were going, I beat you. That's why you're a weaker Christian, because I'm stronger, because I, you know. It causes diversity. And then he says, there was no day more important than the other. He says, so stop treating it that way. He says, but you have to be fully convinced in your own mind. You have to let your conscience bear witness. Let me tell you, your conscience is the red flag. These are the gray areas that we have in our lives. The gray areas that we have, like I don't really know, the scripture's not really clear. I'm just going to have to come before the Lord, and right here, right now, this is where I'm at. I'll never forget, Pastor Tony Thomas was preaching one day, and he was preaching against Santa Claus. He said the whole sermon was preaching against Santa Claus. He said, I've just been pastoring just a couple months. And, he, and, and 30 years later, he looked at me, and he said, it was around Christmas time. He said, you believe I preached on that? Hell, he said, how dumb was that? But you know what? That's where he was at that particular time. And there's people that get hung up on stuff from their past, and they, they, this is how it is, and they would, that young man would live and die, and the fear in his face that was in my college dorm why I was playing solitaire on the computer, I thought we were going to have to come to Jesus' meeting. I mean, I was really getting ready to repent. Verse 6, the one who observes the day observes it for the Lord. The one who eats does it in regard to the Lord. For he gives thanks to God. The one who does not eat, for it is the, one, the Lord he does not eat. He gives thanks to God. This is an awesome passage of Scripture. Here, here we go. Ready? He says, the strong is doing it before the Lord. So he's saying here, Verse 21 is talking about drinking wine. We understand the context of that. I'll explain all that next week. He's talking about eating meat. He's talking about being a vegetarian, observing one day over the other one. He was saying, guess what? When the strong does it and they have the liberty and freedom to do what they're going to do, they're doing it to glorify God. But then he says, when the weak does not eat the meat, when the weak doesn't go to the movies, when the weak does all these things, because this is where their conscience is, he says, they glorify God. He said, so if you're strong in your faith and you say, these are the freedoms that I have, or if you're weak in your faith and these are the freedoms I have, they both have the same goal, and it is to glorify God in their bodies. They're accomplishing the same thing. So, no matter if you're weak, and that's not something that is negative, it means I do not have the freedoms that somebody else may have. And the question I would ask you is, why don't you have them? Why don't you have the freedoms? Do you not have certain freedoms because you're like, you know what? Because of the people that I'm around, because of the background I came from, all these things, that's great. But understand this, know what the difference is between what the moral law is, ceremonial or tradition. Know what you're saying, okay, this is my preference, this is my opinion, but I will not make somebody else believe that it's right or wrong. 
Verse 7, for not one of us lives for himself, not one of us dies for himself. Now, he kind of turns a, turns a corner. He says, nobody lives for himself. What does he mean? Nobody's an island. You right? Ready? You ever been sitting in a restaurant, and there's a couple people that are talking, and they're loud, and they're laughing, and they're cutting up, and you get to the point where you're trying to lean in and hear what you're going to say. You know what they believe about themselves? I'm the only one in this restaurant, and what you believe doesn't matter. What you think doesn't matter. And this is what he says. You're not on an island, and you don't get to live for yourself. And now he kind of turns the corner to the stronger, the person strong in their faith. He's basically saying this, be careful with your freedoms. Be careful with your liberties, because it's not just about you. You're not doing it for you. He says, no one dies for himself, meaning we cannot live for ourselves and think our freedom's in Christ because I have a freedom in Christ to eat meat, to go to the movies, to watch television, to do these things. He says, you have an obligation to other people around you, weaker brothers and sisters in Christ. He says, do not make them stumble and fall. You don't live on an island. He says, you have to pay attention, because I'm telling you this, that it's very clear. I have certain freedoms in my life that I do not take advantage of. Some of you would be like, I can't believe you have that freedom. I do have that freedom, but that doesn't mean I indulge in that freedom. Because I don't live on an island. Because we have a lot of people looking this direction as believers. And there's some freedoms that I'm going to have, you know what, it's just not worth it. I'm not going to take advantage of it. I'm not going to take a chance of having somebody stumble. What does Jesus say? If you cause one of these little ones to stumble, tie a millstone around your neck and throw yourself off the bridge. He's not talking about a little child. He's talking about a follower after him, one of his children. And then he says in verse 8, For if we live, we live for the Lord. For if we die, we die for the Lord. Therefore, whether we live or die, we are the Lord's. He says, we're living for the Lord. This is not about somebody else or because I want to do something. He says, when we became a Christian, it's not about I, how can I live out my freedoms to the fullest. He says, I'm doing this for the Lord. And then he says, we are the Lord. God is the one who's speaking to our conscience. He's telling us what we need to listen to, what we need to do and don't do. He says, in these gray areas in our lives. He says, whether we, are, we, we, whether we live or die, we are of the Lord's. We are the Lord's. At the beginning and end, our lives are dedicated to the Lord's. For this end, Christ died and lived again, that he might Lord be the Lord, Lord of living and dead. Let me go ahead and tell you, if you don't believe in lordship, that Jesus Christ is Lord, you philosophy, you need to work on your philosophy, because there's a lot of people teach against it. There's no such thing as lordship. Yes, there is. Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior. And this is what he's saying here. For this end, Christ died and lived again. To this end, the very same reason that Christ came, he might be Lord. It reveals his sovereignty. It re reveals his lordship over everybody. The dead and the living. Those who are alive on this earth and those who have already gone on before. He says he is Lord over them. But as for you, why do you judge your brother or sister? Or or you as well. Why do you regard your brother or sister with contempt? For we will all appear before the judgment seat. He says, why are you judging? You strict Christians who are putting the meat, eating, drinking wine, they're putting this under judgment. He says, why are you doing this? Why are you looking at them like you're better, like they're a carnal Christian? He said, stop it. He says, why do you regard? It's, just, it's kind of the same language. Now he talks to the strong Christian. He says, you strong Christian, why are you looking down on the weaker Christian? Because they don't feel the liberty to do something that you do. He said, stop it. All you're doing is causing division. He says, then he says this, we will all stand at the judgment seat. Now, what about, wait a minute. Don't get confused with this. There's a judgment seat of Christ, and there's the great white throne judgment. Unbelievers at the great white throne judgment, judgment seat is Christians. We will all stand at the judgment seat. No, no, no. Who is he talking to? Who is he writing to? The church. We will all, the believers will stand at the judgment seat of Christ. Understand when he's talking about this in the book of Corinthians, he's talking about the Olympic Games. 
Let's pretend you were running a race and there was 10 people in this race and all of a sudden the top three get a prize. And when you were running this race and you got to the finish line and you were number four, did you get beat because you finished fourth? Did you get punished because you finished fourth? Hello? What did you get? Just no prize. You know how people teach the judgment seat often? Is that they're going to be reprimanded severely at the judgment seat. And God's going to throw this screen up and it's going to show everything that you've done. Let me tell you, either you believe that Jesus has forgiven all sin, past, present, and future, or he has not. So what's going to be judged there? Our motives? He's, it's going to be wood, hair, stubble. He's going to send it through the fire. And what comes out on the other side, that will be our reward. He says, ultimately, here it is. At the end, you're not the judge. He is. And you let him handle how they appealed to their own preferences, their own conscience. Stop trying to be their judge. And then he says, Almost done. For it is written, as we, as I live, says the Lord to me, every knee will bow, every tongue will confess, uh, confess to the praise and glory of God. He's, once again, everybody, every knee, every tongue is going to confess, meaning he is the Lord. Every tongue. Jesus is going to be the one who you're going to give an account to. I do not give an account to my wife. She does not give an account to me. Right? In this area, we give an account ultimately to Jesus Christ. That's who we give an account to. In regards to our preferences and opinions. Now, next week, I'm going to go ahead and tell you that he does talk about, so how do we bring these two together? So then each one of us will give an account to God to himself. Ultimately, because of all of us that will appear before this fair and righteous judge, we will give this an account. This is not about our salvation, but this is about our secret thoughts. This is about our motives. Did I break my conscience in this area? Did I do something? Was I convinced to do something I knew I shouldn't have done? He says, he says you will give an account. And lastly, in verse 13, therefore, let us not judge one another anymore. Rather determine this, not to put an obstacle or stumbling block in a brother's or sister's way. This sets us up for next week. Therefore, because I will give an ultimate count to God, and you as a Christian will give an ultimate account, account to God, he says, then stop judgment on them because they already have a judge. You're not it. But then he says this, and this leads us into the rest of this passage. Do not be a stumbling block. Do not be a stumbling block. Just because you have a freedom to do something, to eat that meat or not eat that meat, to go to church on this day or this day, or to celebrate this day or this day, to have a Christmas tree or not have a Christmas tree. He said, be careful. You don't live on an island. He said, don't cause that weaker brother to stumble. Don't try to convince them that it's okay that they do this when it violates their conscience. And by the way, you weaker in faith, don't tell the stronger one that they're wrong because they're doing this. And there's nothing immoral. So what I'm going to get into next week is this. Your liberties and freedoms in Christ. Believe it or not, for some of you, you're like... Oh, I do have freedoms in Christ. I do have liberties in Christ. Absolutely you do. That is between you and God. That's vertical. My freedoms that I have in Christ, sometimes I'm just like, man, I'm so excited. I have the freedom to do this or do this. I have that. This between me and the Lord. But guess what? My exercising of the freedoms is horizontal, meaning it is in front of you. And just because I have liberty of the Lord to do certain things doesn't mean I exercise it horizontally. Why? Because I have a love for people greater than myself. In my Romans class, when we got to chapter 14, one of the students raised his hand. And he said, how do we exercise 
what we're doing. If we have the freedom to do this, and I want to be careful not to make somebody stumble. And he said, can I just use the cheeseburger illustration real quick with you? He said, yeah. He said, if I'm sitting in a restaurant and I'm eating a cheeseburger, and he said, I'm enjoying the cheeseburger, and I have the freedom to eat that cheeseburger, he said, I'm going to eat that cheeseburger, and I'm enjoying it. And all of a sudden, I see somebody else is coming in this restaurant, and it would make them stumble that I'm eating this cheeseburger. He said, I just take my napkin, and I wrap this cheeseburger up, and I put it to the side, and I have a conversation with them. He says, and when they're completely out of view and out of sight, you know what I do? I open up my cheeseburger, and I keep eating it. He said, because I may have that, I want to practice that liberty. I have that liberty, but look, that doesn't mean I get to exercise it in front of whoever I want. And I thought, what a great illustration to end with today. We have people from diverse backgrounds, traditions in here. There are people in here today that have never touched a a deck of cards because of that very background traditions and you said you know what Chris I don't don't, I don't have the freedom to do this God has never given me this freedom for some of you others you meet once a week to play cards with somebody you're saying I'm not making anybody stumble the people I play with is fine God says if you have a clear conscience but guess what don't exercise that if it is going to make somebody stumble that leads us to next week's message father God we love you today The biggest thing that I think for me through this, God, is this, is how is it that I may look down on somebody else or judge somebody else because they feel like they have the freedom in something or I don't, or how somebody looks at me when I have a freedom that they don't. Do we really judge people based upon the Word of God or do we judge people based upon our belief system, our opinions, our preferences? God, let us be able, to dis- be able to distinguish between both. In Jesus' name, amen. If you give me just a couple minutes to get to the back door, I'd love to shake your hand. God bless you. <clears throat>